Okay, so are we talking about narcissistic parents? Great question. So we are talking about entitled parents. And so this is the first thing. So let's talk about entitled parents. So what I, I want to do is explain a little bit about uh, my experience with uh, working with people who have entitled parents and sort of how to understand them and what seems to work. The first thing that we're going to talk about is that a narcissistic parent an entitled and an entitled parent is not necessarily the same. So oftentimes entitlement and narcissism tend to overlap. But I think about narcissism as essentially a fragile sense of internal self that requires a lot of very careful outward appearance and treatment to sort of maintain your internal sense of self. So narcissists sort of take the like take things in the world around them as like personal insults. So if, for example, you're supposed to pick me up from the airport and you get a flat tire on the way, I will take that as a personal insult if I am a narcissist. Well, I mean, not necessarily, but oftentimes we'll take, you know, things that have nothing to do with my life and take them as personal insults. So it's like, oh my God, you don't care about me enough to be on time. I waited so long. I've been waiting here for a long time and there was this creepy person and oh my God, like, I can't believe that you would do this to me. I would never do this to you. So everything sort of becomes about the relationship between me and you, even though it's like you got a flat tire and you had to change your tire in the rain, like that sucks. But all I can kind of think about is myself. The other aspect of narcissism is also that you have to maintain an outwardly elevated sense of self because you feel insecure on the inside. So, you know, I can't be insulted. I can't, I have to dress a particular way. People need to treat me a particular way because that's how I know that I'm worth something because on the inside, I'm afraid of, of, you know, what my true value is. So that's a little bit different from entitled parents. So in, in entitled parents, what we're really thinking about is entitlement. So oftentimes they overlap, but entitlement is sort of about rights, right? So it's like, I deserve X, Y, and Z. Um, and so oftentimes narcissism and entitlement can go hand in hand. But what I really think about in terms of entitled parents is parents who don't respect boundaries, parents who don't respect autonomy, parents who don't sort of give their kids choices and respect their choices. That's what I think of as an entitled parents. So I'm going to give you guys just like one example. So I was working with a, a kid who is South Asian. Um, so growing up, you know, his parents were very controlling and also kind of very entitled. And so they would sort of regulate a lot of what he could or couldn't do. They, they started him like playing tennis at the age of like seven, started having him play like chess and a musical instrument at the age of like eight or nine, um, maybe even younger. So he was sort of like this Indian kid. And then in high school, you know, they told him like, okay, here are your career options. You're going to, you know, we want you to play chess. We want you to play a musical instrument and you're going to be a tennis athlete. Those are going to be your options. He sort of like was interested in basketball and baseball. And they're like, yeah, we, you know, literally the, the, <laughs> what his parents told him is our people don't do that. <laughs> okay. And so he decided like, they were like, yeah, like if you, you know, we'd really like it if you wanted to be a doctor, but he wasn't interested in being a doctor. So he ended up um, becoming a, a studying CS, which was somewhat of an uphill battle. Uh, his parents didn't allow him to go to prom, so he wanted to go to prom and was arguably dating a girl, but they were like, no, you're, you're not allowed to do that. Um, so they were just really, really controlling and felt like they had the right to make decisions for him. So they were also, he was also a gamer, but they were very, very strict on what kind of, uh, you know, gaming he could do. And his mom would set like really, really firm limits. So he goes off to college, has a little bit of a rough year or two in terms of like, learning how to deal with his newfound freedom. Parents were also quite controlling in terms of like mandating all kinds of random crap that he really didn't adhere to because they didn't have any power over him. But they're like, you need to be, you know, you can no leaving your dorm past nine o'clock. You need to be back at your dorm by 9 p.m. every single day. And they would like call him and, and things like that. And if he didn't answer, they'd get pissed off all this kind of stuff. So like super controlling, felt like his choices were not his own, like his parents made his choices for him. So he tried to sort of argue with them about this stuff. So like at many points throughout his life, he would like have arguments with his parents and he'd say things like, this is not what I want to do. And they'd say like, okay, well, we don't care. 
right? Like you have to do what we tell you to do because we're your parents and you have to listen to us. And so something funny happened. So dad actually, so mom was a stay at home mom. Dad was, um, lost his job during the pandemic. And so after he had been out of school for one year, landed a pretty good job and still parents were like pretty entitled, pretty, you know, would want him to call every day and things like that. So he goes home and, um, because his parents need help, um, sort of supporting the family and things like that because his dad has lost his job. So he's essentially like paying the parents bills and, you know, he goes home and then he's like gaming at night and his mom comes in at like 10 PM and she's like, it's too late and you should stop gaming. And he's like, I have a job. Like, what are you complaining about? They get into a brief argument and then mom unplugs his PC. So what do you think he does at that point? Absolutely. Right. So he doesn't rage. He moves out. And so he's like, and because mom, you know, mom and dad are kind of like, there's like a brief argument and there's this sort of like my house, my rules, you have to respect the rules of the house. And he's like, okay, so if I have to adhere to your rules living here, I'm going to move out. And so the next morning, like overnight, like he doesn't say that. So the next like overnight, he kind of packs his stuff and moves out. And then parents are like, wait, what? You're moving out? And then he's like, yeah, I mean, you said your rules, your house. So I'm moving out so I can live my life the way that I want to. Parents start to panic. There are financial considerations. They're like, oh, no, no. Like, like, wait, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Like, we need your help, like things like that. And he's like, okay, so if you need like financial support, you know, you guys raised me and stuff. So that's fine. I'll like, I'll pay your bills for some amount of time. Not a big deal, but I'm not going to live here. And, and so it was a really kind of interesting, you know, dynamic because then like the parents were kind of really shocked. And so as the conversation kind of went on, so I, I was working with him at, at the time. And so we started to have like a couple of conversations with his parents and, and were actually able to bring his parents around to a couple of things because I don't think his parents sort of realized what they were doing. I don't think they really understood the power dynamics of the situation. I don't think they had accomplished what they thought they had accomplished. They were shooting for obedience instead of like understanding or any kind of relationship. They wanted a robot for a son as opposed to like a thinking adult. Part of that is I think heavily cultural, but I sort of see it outside of the South Asian culture for sure, where people, parents sort of expect obedience. They expect, you know, that they are entitled to, um, you know, private communications that their kid has. They are entitled to violate their kids boundaries and space and determine what they do and what they don't do. So what I'd like to do is just share with you guys like a couple of ways to think about entitled parents. If you guys have entitled parents, how to have conversations with them and more importantly, how not to have conversations with them. And then ultimately, hopefully try to do your best to build a relationship that is like somewhat healthy. Okay. So the first thing to understand is entitled parents tend to be entitled, not because of like moral deficiencies of character that are genetic or intrinsic, but honestly, because of the way that they were raised. So oftentimes, if you think about a particular parenting style, we learn what appropriate parenting is by how we were parented. So in, in this kid's case, I mean, this is like a long, it's like a whole culture, right? So where like in the South Asian culture, like this is what you do. You do this and then you do this and then you do this. Your parents even, not even in extreme cases, I was about to say in extreme cases, but even in quite common cases will determine who you will marry. Like I met someone in my neighborhood a couple months ago and, you know, they were telling me, so they're my age um, and even a few years younger. And they were actually telling me that they met their spouse like on the day of their engagement and hung out with them for a total of about three hours before their wedding. So they met once for like an hour and a half and they like saw each other twice for like an hour and then like half an hour. So this is kind of a culture that you come from. So in the, in the case of South Asian stuff, it's like very cultural, but we also find that, you know, you don't have to be South Asian. I've worked with a lot of pe people who are Caucasian, a lot of people who are black, a lot of people who are African-American or even Nigerian, whose parents are very, very controlling and very entitled to their kid's life. 
And so what we tend to find is that the reason, oftentimes the reason that they are that way, or one big reason is because that's the way their parents were with them. And so it's not to say that we shouldn't hold people responsible for their actions, but at the same time, we should try to understand where their actions are coming from. Because if our goal is to build a healthy relationship, understanding is just as important as change. So then the next question becomes, okay, so if they were raised to like kind of think this way, what do we do about that? And this is where we get into the first problem that many people who are dealing with entitled parents make, so many kids, is that they try to convince. So in my experience, trying to convince entitled parents of something is generally speaking a waste of time. So don't try to justify, don't argue, don't explain, don't try to bring them to your way of thought. Because generally speaking, like it's going to frustrate you and like they're just not going to do it. So instead, the goal is to get them to think, okay? Not to convince them that you're right, but to get, get them to sort of like question and examine their own beliefs, right? So you're not trying to bring them to where you are. We're just both going to look at their viewpoint. So for example, like, you know, this was a, a conversation, this was part of the conversation, you know, uh, my patient had with his parents was so he kind of talked to them and he was like, so as, as, as he moved out and he's like, if you guys need financial support, that's fine. I'm just not going to live with you. And they felt like really hurt and betrayed. And then he was kind of asking them like, you know, what is our, what is our relationship right now? So like, to, and this is where we use a technique called going meta. So you ask them to think about or explain to you what their understanding of your relationship is. So you can start with a question of like, what is this relationship? Like, what are the rules of this relationship to you? How does this relationship work? And this is where a lot of things like power dynamics come in, but it's essentially like, you know, just asking them like, you know, how does this work? And it's kind of weird because most entitled parents never really think about the rules of the game that they are teaching you. And it's my experience that once you show them and, and once they realize the rules of the game that they're playing, they no longer want to play it anymore. I know it sounds kind of weird, but you don't have to convince them of anything. You just have to point out the rules to them. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, it's sort of this idea that like the parents were like, well, like you're our son, so you have to listen to us. And then, and then, so he, he was kind of saying, well, like I listened to you because I didn't have a choice. Like, what do you guys think about that? You know, you, as soon as I have like, and so this is where a conversation, oftentimes a conversation about power dynamics comes in. So this is a question. Number one is like, what are the rules of this relationship? Like, how does our relationship work? Second, second uh, question is, you know, what is the value of my opinion in this relationship? So you have a particular opinion. I have a particular opinion. How do we decide what to do? So if we have a disagreement on opinion, this is not even talking about anything specific. It's not about whether I can go to prom or not go to prom. It's just asking them, you know, so in this relationship, when I believe one thing and you believe something else, how do we decide which person to go with? And essentially what entitled parents will come down to is that it's a, a game of power dynamics, right? I'm the parent, I'm the boss, I pay the bills, therefore I get the decision. And this is where uh, you really have a good opportunity because if, if that's the situation, you can't really argue with them, right? So as, as you are not financially independent, as you are dependent on their par on your parents, you have to play by their rules. Like it's, it's going to be really hard to change that. So you can acknowledge that power dynamic, but you also want to make it clear to the parents that if this is the way that the game is being played, that's fine. What do you think is going to happen when I am no longer financially dependent? Right? So if this is the rules of the game is that like if if it's your house and your rules and and you know like we're just trusting you because I don't have an opinion or because you're the adult and I'm a child in the relationship, like that's fine, but what happens when we're both adults? Like I, I'm not, you know, so you kind of like point out the rules to them. And eventually kind of what we got to is, you know, the parents sort of understood this when like their son was like, yeah, so what do you guys expect? So this is another thing is ask the parents. So when dealing with entitled parents, I think a big, a big solution is to get them to think about the evolution of your relationship over time. So this is kind of how, how this patient did. And he's like, what are y'all expecting about, you know, when I get married, what do you guys think is going to happen when I get married? And they were like, well, you know, we'll have a big Indian wedding. And he's like, why do you, why would I, why would I do that? What makes you think that I'm going to do that? 
If we've determined that the reason that I'm listening to you is because you guys hold power over me, you no longer have that. So why would I listen to you anymore? And so then they were like, what does this mean? Does this mean that you're not going to get married? And he's like, no, I may get married, but what do you guys, you know, I'm going to do what I feel like. But what are y'all envisioning about the future of our relationship? Are you guys envisioning that you will come to my wedding? And this is the kind of thing where it's like, you know, this can feel like an attack. And it's kind of interesting because the parents will perceive it as attack, but that's really not an attack. So you don't want to get upset. You don't want to convince. You don't want to punish your entitled parent. You just want to get them to think, what does this mean? You're not going to invite us to our wedding? I didn't say that. So this is where you guys can use another meta technique, which is like asking the parent in the conversation, what did you hear me say or what did you hear me ask? And so really what you want to do is don't try to convince them of anything. Genuinely try to understand their expectations. And what we find is that as a lot of these unthought and unconsidered ideas come to the surface, this is when we start to see entitled behavior change. So as the, as, as the, the kid genuinely sort of is, is asking his parents, like, what are you guys expecting and what do you base that on? And so this is where, like, remember, step one is like, what is the nature of our relationship? When we have a disagreement, how does the decision get made? And what are you guys expecting our relationship to look like in the future? Right? So th these are kind of like the three steps that you've got to take. And this is where, like, I've had this conversation. So uh, another uh, person I worked with, you know, had a very controlling mother, was a woman. And so she was sort of asking the question of, like, you know, what's your understanding of, like, how happy I've been as a kid growing up? What's your understanding of like what I think about, you know, how decisions make and like, do you understand that I find you to be quite controlling? You know, and they're like, oh yeah, but it's, it's for your, you know, it's, it's for your benefit. Like we're doing this because like, I know better. And so then, you know, th this is a, an, another client of mine who is like, so mom, like what's, what's your expectation about your, like how much you're going to see your grandchildren? And then like, she's like, well, of course, like, I'm going to like, I'm going to be very involved. And then, then this is where her daughter is like, well, what makes you think that? You know, it, it, it's kind of interesting because like, but I'm your mother. You're like, yeah, I understand you're my mother, but you know, it seems that most of our relationship seems to be like quite one-sided. Like you seem to determine the nature and style of interaction and you don't seem to respect my opinions or really listen to what I'm saying. And so... I don't, I don't want that kind of person in my, in my kid's life. And so then the mom is like, but I, but I, I deserve, like, are you telling me that I'm never going to be able to see my grandkid? And it's like, well, no, I mean, you'll be able to see them, but I don't want you to be a big part of their life if you're going to be like this. And so then like the, the, then this is where the parent is like, well, but then like, like, what do you want me to do? Like, and so oftentimes what the parents will do, so when you kind of get through to them, okay, so you're not really saying that you're going to, you're not like trying to convince them of anything, right? It's just about sort of laying a boundary. And then oftentimes what the parent will do is will, will be like, well, like, you know, what, how, how can I fix this? Like, I'm, I'm sorry, just tell me what I need to do to make it better. And so this is where things get really, really tricky. Um, so I'll give you guys kind of a third example. So I had, I had a, a, a client who parents wanted them to come home for the holidays Client really didn't want to come home for the holidays. It was like, yeah, I'm not comfortable coming home. I'm just, I don't want to do that. And, and then the parent was like, well, why don't you want to do that? You should come. And it gets into this argument about the parent trying to convince them, like, come home for the holidays, come home for the holidays. Like, if you don't do this, oh, your, your dad will be so disappointed and everyone will wonder where you are. Like, you know, your aunts, they'll start asking questions. Why isn't this person home for the holidays? Is everything okay? Like, why don't you just come home? Like, everyone will like that. And you're, they're like, yeah, I'm not interested in that. And so then, then it kind of gets into the situation where you're like, okay, so then like, how do you deal with that? And so you can lay a boundary and you can say, you know, mom, if we're talking about coming home from the holidays, like, what is this conversation about? Why are you calling? Are you trying to convince me to come home for the holidays? Go meta. Just ask your parent, like, what is this? What are we doing? What's the purpose of this conversation? And then lay your boundary. Okay. So then they're like, yeah, well, we are talking, well, I'm, we're talking about the holidays. And you're like, I'm not interested in talking about that. I'm going to hang up the phone now. If you want to talk about other stuff, I'm totally fine with that. And then you hang up. So lay a boundary, right? So this also involves a certain amount of uh, power dynamics and independence on your part. And then, you know, mom will call back a little bit later. 
And so once again, kind of go meta, what are we talking about, mom? Yeah, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm going to hang up the phone. And so then eventually the parent will like ask, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you being like this? You can say, yeah, the reason I don't want to come home for the holidays is because you don't respect my boundaries. And then the parent is like, okay, fine. I'll respect your boundaries. Fine. Fine. Just tell me like how to respect your boundaries. And so then you can say, this is my favorite. <laughs> One of my favorite interactions. So what have I told you is my boundary about coming home and conversations about coming home? And then they're like, you said that you don't want to talk about coming home and you don't want to come home. Good. How can you respect my boundary around that? Not talk to you about coming home and not pressure you to come home. Excellent. But then what about coming home? Exactly, mom. Now do you get it? This is the problem. When I share something with you about the boundary they ha I have, you are willing to say that you're going to do anything. You'll respect my boundaries. You'll, do, you'll respect any boundary that I set, except for the one that you don't respect. Right? And like, this is the key thing is like, it's about understanding, right? So like, when you get to that point and like, you, you just share with your parents, you're like, yeah, so, and they're like, how do I get you to come? What do I have to do to get you to come? And this is where like, the, you can say, you can't. Part of respecting my boundaries is respecting my decision that I'm not going to come. And if you can do that, I think we can have a relationship. If not, I think it's not going to be, it's not going to be much of a relationship. All right, so this is really challenging. But when dealing with entitled parents, once again, don't try to convince them. Don't try to tell them, hey, it's like a bad idea for me to come. I don't want to come. Here's why I don't want to come. Here's why coming is a bad idea for me. I want you to just like, like, don't try to convince them of anything. Okay. Just get them to think. And the way that you get them to think is by asking them questions like, what is the nature of our relationship? What is the, what, what is going on chat? <laughs> what? Clip city. What are you guys talking Okay. Oh, coming home for the holidays, chat. Come on, Jesus. Okay. I'm going to keep going, all right? I'm going to just keep plowing forward, okay? Just keep, keep plowing forward. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so number one, ask about the nature of the relationship. Number two, talk a little bit about, like, what is the nature of how agreements and disagreements are resolved? Who gets to decide? And this is the really tricky thing is as you guys have conversations about this, you know, it's like completely fine to have a conversation about it. Like it's going to, we'll get to a couple of other points about why these conversations are hard, but you just want to bring it to the surface about how the decision gets made. So is it because they're parents? Is it because you live under their house? Like that's fine, right? Like if you can't, if that's the power dynamic that exists and you don't have power in the relationship, there's really not much you can do about it, which is feels bad, man. Okay. So like Sag, but that's the truth of it. At least acknowledge it. And then the third thing that's really, really helpful in terms of getting entitled parents to really like think is to ask them, like, what do you imagine our relationship is going to be like two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? And then if you want to, you can ask them, is it okay if I share my perspective? And so then they say, of course you can share your perspective. And then you can say, well, so like, I think that our, in this relationship, I don't feel respected. So I think that you have power and I don't. But the reason that we maintain this relationship is because I don't have a choice. I feel like I'm a hostage, which is fine. It's just, you know, as I start to gain independence, I'm not sure how much of a relationship I want to have. And you have to be really careful about saying something like that, especially if there's a power dynamic or something like that. You have to be able to sort of determine your parents' ability to tolerate that kind of statement. But I think it is a really useful question um, to sort of ask your parents, like, what do you imagine our relationship is going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now? And, you know, what, how is that relationship going to be different from this one? And it's been my experience that when you stop trying to convince them and invite them to like really understand, and you also try to understand, you genuinely try to understand their perspective. Like it actually really helps move things in the right direction. So a couple of caveats. Okay. The first is that this is very, very hard. So like a big part of these conversations involves 
grieving and letting go and accepting that your parent is not going to say what you want them to say. Right? So that's really tough. Like, it's hard to sit down in a conversation and recognize that your parent has power over you, whether it be financial or, like, other kinds of power, and that, like, you're the weak person in the relationship. The interesting thing is that, like, as you start to, like, accept that and admit that and actually come to that conclusion with your parent, the relationship can feel a lot less burdensome. Because oftentimes what I find is that people are, like, they're so upset by the injustice of it, which absolutely, like, you should be upset by the injustice of it. But you being upset by the injustice doesn't actually, by itself, change the injustice. Right? I know it sounds kind of weird, like, this is something that I know is confusing for the internet. But outrage does not make the world a better place. It is the actions that follow outrage that either make the world a better place or a worse place. Right? Because there are a lot of actions that come out of a feeling of outrage or injustice that actually can make the world a, a worse place. And it's really, really dangerous territory because, and so this is why, like, you know, what I advocate for y'all is not necessarily to take a drastic action because of the injustice, but just acknowledge if your parents have the power in the relationship, just acknowledge that they have it. And what power do you have in the relationship now? You have the power of memory. Right? So you are going to remember how they treat you. And how they treat you today is going to a certain degree sow the karmic seeds for how you treat them tomorrow. And this is the main, this is really only like the only leverage that you have if you're in a large like power dynamic relationship. And, and so this is kind of the, the sort of thing that like you just need to share with them like, okay, if this is what the relationship is like, what do you imagine it going? Because basically, you know, I feel like our connection is a lot, is very circumstantial. Like, I'm here because I have to be here, but I don't feel like y'all respect me as people. Like, you don't respect me as a person. You don't respect my opinions. You don't care to listen to them or understand them, which is my observation. I don't need to convince you that you should be listening to me. So don't go down that route, which is like very dangerous, right? Because it's easy to go down that route. But you can say, this has been my observation. Because when you tell me to do something and I disagree, like, I don't want to be a doctor, but you tell me that I have to major in this. So that's an example of me not respecting, y'all not respecting my opinion. And then this is where they go down the tangent of, but no, but it's good for you. Like, we know better. We're your parents. You can say, like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not debating that you guys have been alive longer than I have and that you may know better than I do. But I'm still not hearing you guys, like, ask or care about what I, what I want. Right? So you guys are operating from you know better, but I'm not hearing anything about what I want. And so you can point that out, right? That's the nature of the relationship. Decisions get made by their subjective sense of what is better as opposed to what you want. And so then like later on, you can kind of let them know, okay, so like you guys believe this, but you don't, uh, do y'all see how it doesn't appear to me like you guys care about what I want? You guys are valuing better over want, right? What I care about is not as important as what you guys think is good for me, which is fine. Let's just call it what it is. And so over time, yeah, so someone's saying, like, my parents don't believe that their, their view is subjective, which is fair, right? So like, that's a fair point of view. You don't need to argue with them about that. They say, we've been alive. We are higher level than you are. We have more XP. Therefore, we know better. If I am, you know, Diamond League in LOL and you're Bronze League in LOL, I may know more about the game than you do. So you don't want to go down that road of whether they're objectively correct or subjectively correct or whatever. The, the, the argument that you want to go down or like the point that you want to make is like, you guys are operating on a belief of what's better and I'm operating on a belief of like what I want to do, right? If I want to play techies, I'm going to play techies. Forget that it ruins everyone else's game. So, so this is kind of like, this is our, my kind of uh, guidebook to dealing with entitled parents, right? Which is like, so notice the nature of the relationship. Like, ask them, okay, what's going on here? Acknowledge the power dynamics. So that's sort of like, when we have a disagreement, how does the decision get made? And then invite your parents to think a little bit about how this relationship is going to evolve over time. So this is also where you don't want to punish them, right? So you got to be really careful here because it can turn into a, if you don't let me do this, I'm going to cut you out of my life. That's not what you want to do. You don't want to be like emotional about it. You don't want to threaten them. You just want to say like, okay, so 
you know, what do you imagine this is going to look like? And I'm not so sure that like, I'm going to be comfortable with that kind of relationship as I become more independent. What do you think about that? Right. And, and so the conversation should be calm. It should be collected. You have to let go of your own emotions, right? Acknowledge that your parents may not care about your opinion. Acknowledge that you're the weak party in the relationship and recognize that time is on your side, right? So as, as you get older, you will gradually gain more independence. You have more independence in college than you did in high school. You have more independence after college than you did, you know, during college. As you become financially independent, then you will have even more, you know, control over your own life. And the main message that you want to get across to them is not that you're going to cut them out because you don't want to threaten them. Because if you threaten them, that's going to evoke their defensiveness and whatever narcissism is there will come out swinging if you kind of threaten them. So you don't want to do that. You just want to invite them to think. That's the goal, not to convince, to invite them to think. So what do you guys think is going to happen?